the largest climate change conference organized by the United Nations. COP29 for 2024 took place in Baku, Azerbaijan. Every year, this event attracts thousands of government representatives, policymakers, industry leaders and investors, all united in their mission to combat climate change while ensuring the availability of sustainable energy and economic stability. Alongside the main conference, the pavilions serve as a vital venue for countries to hold private discussions aimed at presenting viable investment opportunities. The South African Pavilion seized this chance to address the pressing issues related to the shift towards cleaner energy sources, while also emphasizing critical areas where investment is essential to accelerate this transition. Under the theme of shaping climate ambition at COP29, securing finance and advancing a just transition. For Anglo-American thinking about the climate transition in particular, we've gone through a period where the portfolio has evolved, uh, actively taken that decision, for example, very relevant for South Africa for, to demerge uh, our thermal coal assets and create Tugela resources, which continues to operate South Africa. But um, most importantly as well, it's about decarbonizing our operations. So in the lingo, this one of the things, going about that in a way which is consistent with expectations in each one of the jurisdictions we operate. Whilst we operate in South Africa, we also operate in Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Brazil, Chile, Peru, uh, Australia and, and Canada. So we've got a, it's a whole lot of that for scopes one and two. So in 2018, we set some targets to reduce our operational emissions by 30% by 2030. And then we extended that to be operationally carbon neutral, carbon neutral by 2040. So across the whole portfolio being operationally carbon neutral. And then we've looked really, really hard at what that means in each jurisdiction. And in one hand, it's about transitioning the electricity supply, which I'll come back to. So moving from uh, hydrocarbon based electricity supply to, to renewables or to zero emissions uh, supply. And then there's all sorts of other aspects of the operational emissions transitioning away from diesel being a very obvious one for mining but also for us at the moment we have um, steel making coal assets in in australia where actually we have quite a lot of fugitive methane and from a scope one perspective as of today the biggest aspect of our scope one emissions globally is our methane emissions in, in australia but but diesel is the bit that people think about when they think about mining so i happily cut back to that as well then when you look about our trajectory from from 2018 or rather from 2016 which is the baseline we're working from but I had this conversation on a panel in, in LME week in London recently where I said, well, your emissions have only gone down 6% since your baseline in 2016. And that's absolutely true if you take those two data points. But as we show in all of our reporting, our emissions are always going to go up to 2019 with production. And then they've come down. So from 2016 to about now, they're about 6 or 7% lower. But from the peak, they're about 26% lower. So we've taken about 26% of the emissions out. It's a combination of things, but managing methane better transitioning our electricity supply in South America to renewables through power purchase agreements. And then we're building the capacity in South Africa through, the, through a company called Envusa Energy, which we formed with EDF Renewables in order to build capacity that will then wheel through the ESCOM grid to, to offset our electricity uh, emissions in, in South Africa. South Africa is in, in a, a, particular, a particularly acute case in terms of being quite a fossil fuel heavy economy right now and will be for probably for a little while longer, uh, whilst also actively uh, investing in the green economy. So um, as a participant in that, in terms of the, the fossil fuel uh, debate, and Anglo would be a good example, in terms of working with someone like Anglo-American um, as a listed shareholder in their just transition, um, because we can't just simply go straight from fossil fuels to renewables. It has to be done in a, in a measured fashion. Um, and uh, that's a journey we'd like to go on together as a shareholder in those companies. And so we work very actively with the management um, of all, all the companies we invest in. Uh, and on, on this particular topic, it'll be the fossil fuel producers. And uh, working with them to, to help with their transition. Um, what we don't do is sell out of the fossil fuel players and invest in green economy. We have to do both. And so that's a very active dialogue. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a really good dialogue. And what we're really looking for is clarity and clear plans in terms of that journey. Uh, and I think Angle is a great example where, you know, that journey is happening. And therefore, we, together, we can track those, 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 and sometimes those nuances. 
because as I say, South Africa is on, on its own particular just transition journey. And, you know, the S in ESG is a very important part of that. You know, a big part of our, our nation relies on fossil fuel production at the moment in terms of jobs. So we have to transition effectively with that in mind as well. So we have to do both things at once, and we work with all our companies in that endeavor, uh, whilst investing in large swathes of renewable energy uh, at all reach all, in terms of mobilizing the private capital on behalf of our clients, in terms of our fiduciary duty. We invested an enormous amount on their behalf in renewable energy, in wind, wind and solar power. Um, and of the six gigawatts, I think, which is put into South Africa, we've invested on behalf of our clients about half of that in terms of direct and co-investments. So we're very proud of that, and, but it's, it's a two-track journey in terms of that transition. What we've seen also is um, there's been a focus on green investment that's centered around renewable energy. And I think in the South African context, it, it's been in, on a needs basis, right? It responded to our energy security at a point. Um, but I think what we're seeing with some of our clients is that there's a far broader view to what climate change or climate um, finance looks like. Um, so, you know, we're seeing clients in the real estate sector that are really tapping into green parts. Um, and they're aligning that with the broader ESG strategy to green their buildings. And by greening their buildings, I mean, essentially, that means getting your, your, your property portfolio grid certified to demonstrate um, the energy and resource efficiency of your growth. Um, uh, and that's, that's in response to the fact that the real estate sector contributes about 40% um, to the broader um, emission uh, hunter. So, so that's, that's that different view to what uh, climate action and climate finance looks like. It's not just renewable energy, but it's quite broad-based across various sectors. So yeah, real estate, to name a few, water, water infrastructure uh, as a number one, sustainable water and waste water management. Um, so a broad-based approach to addressing the climate crisis that isn't just renewable energy. Definitely still investing in renewable energy because um, I think, yeah, we can all appreciate the relevance and importance of it for our country and the continent at large by taking a broader view of what uh, climate adaptation and mitigation looks like. What does climate change and adaptation look like for South Africa? In 2020, the government launched a decade-long strategy aimed at transforming the nation into a climate-resilient society while pursuing sustainable development. For us as South Africa, right? Um, our aims are the same with other developing countries. Everybody who is here has called this a, a finance corp. Uh, so the big issue is the um, uh, new finance goal, uh, because this year, according to previous mandates, we have to agree on the climate finance goal. The 100 billion US dollars has expired or is expiring at the end of the COP. Uh, so we are all focused on that. But then there are other critical issues um, uh, such as uh, the rules for carbon trading, uh, the mitigation uh, issues or issues of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, that uh, Minister Dion George will be facilitating next week. Uh, critical, as you would know. Uh, the world is not on track when it comes to reducing uh, emissions. Uh, so that issue remains uh, top of the agenda. And of course, financing for our uh, building resilience, uh, adapt what we call adaptation. So those are the major issues uh, that we will be focused on, or we are focusing on. And speak to me about the role of partnerships and what they do just in terms of accelerating South Africa's climate ambitions. Partnerships are critical. I mean, even in the negotiations themselves, we are talking about international cooperation mm -hmm. uh, because climate change affects everybody, right? Uh, and you know, many of us are still uh, in the, uh, we are still developing. Uh, our economies are still uh, developing. Uh, so it means we have to do things uh, in the right way, uh, where we have to decarbonize and go green. Uh, so that is where partnerships comes in. That's why you see South Africa always uh, um, uh, courting uh, partners that could help us with our own decarbonization, because this is not something that you can do with your own resources. Yep. The significance of partnerships goes beyond national boundaries. We are confronted with extraordinary climate challenges, including soaring temperatures and severe weather effects that affect our environment. With finance being the focal point of COP29, merely advocating for funding will not suffice 
to guarantee the success of climate adaptation efforts. We have all these plans in place. How do you make sure that all the ministries, all the all the agencies buy into this plan? How how are the actions coordinated? Uh, and and I must say this is a really difficult task. Um, um, something like looking for a unicorn, something that doesn't really exist. But the, there are there are um, ways that we have tried to make this work, uh, and and some of I, I'd like to discuss some of these ways um, now. So so one of the things uh, that one of the the procedures that was put in place when we uh, developed our indices was that, <clears throat> for example, uh, I, I, I could talk more about the, the adaptation aspect of our NDCs. Uh, and at, actually, in Sri Lanka's NDCs, the adaptation as, uh, aspect is, is much stronger than the mitigation aspect, uh, obviously, because we are not a, a, a strong emitter. Uh, uh, and in, in the adaptation NDCs, there are nine key sectors that have been uh, identified as highly vulnerable, uh, and which include uh, water resources, agriculture and food security, tourism, human settlements, health, etc. Now, in, in developing the NDCs, uh, the task of developing each of these NDCs was given to the ministries that are in charge of this in each of these sectors. The Climate Change Secretariat led the process, but the NDCs were developed by the ministries or agencies who are the focal points for each of these sectors. What are your priorities? What are your priorities for the country? And how do you align your priorities with climate action? Business would look for certain indicators, uh, which, you know, everybody, I can rattle them off like in five seconds. Everybody knows what they are, right? sound regulatory environment, enabling environment, fiscal incentive, you know, that, that is very common and very simple. And that's probably true. Uh, but a clear sense of investment plan and what you're trying to achieve. So your long-term goal, like the long-term vision, but also the sort of five-year plan that business could feed into is very helpful. But I also think there might be some business-related indicators for how you maximize the potential of the business sector as well, uh, which are that business can be a formal collaborator, or informal collaborator. So informal collaborator could be like we're in an informal partnership and we draw on in-kind support from the private sector or we co-create and we co-develop and we co-invest in a project or a partnership. And that could be MOU-based and you know, it could be very like uh, very informal. But that is an indicator in itself because it's showing that there's growing trust between the different entities. From our side, what is going to be more important is really to see where things are going especially around uh, the pledges, the financial pledges that have been made and how that translates into money flowing. But I guess also important issues around, uh, you know, loss and damage, discussions around that, how that uh, the impetus of what was agreed in the previous COP translates into actionable um, activities that will start benefiting countries that are in dire need of the resources. And in your view, just following up from last year's COP, is there any progress that has been made? I mean, we do know that last year the big focus was moving away from fossil fuels. How far are we? I think the, you know, it's always challenging, um, I guess, reviewing how much progress we have had from one COP to the next. But I think what we can never minimize is the importance of continuing putting on the pressure to ensure that we do not lose momentum. It is desirable, however, that we would be having more progress than we are having at the moment. I would concede that. But I think it is important that we keep on talking and putting on the pressure so that we start seeing a lot more momentum in terms of the important work that needs to be done. What, is, what do we expect here? As you know very well, you know, Africa is being impacted by climate change. You know, seven out of the ten most vulnerable countries in the world are found in Africa. Uh, we are the least emitters, but we are getting the brunt of the impacts, the negative impacts of climate change. And therefore, you know, here it's 
just to show that there should be justice, that should be fairness in terms of really addressing our needs, environmental needs, and and uh, you know, and making sure that we are implementing our long-term development plan without any interruption, or if there is any interruption, we need to really work together collectively with the rest of the world in terms of coming out with mitigation measures and adaptation measures, which are already being promised by the world since 2015, the Paris, um, uh, the COP in Paris. And therefore, you know, we are here to say, to reclaim our rights, actually, in terms of saying, listen, let's use the market and non-market mechanisms to make sure that Africa addresses its climate change uh, challenges through mitigation, but also, most importantly, through adaptation. The effect of climate change impacts every economic sector, and one sector that is particularly challenged by its effects is manufacturing. What sustainable industrial strategies can be adopted to create projects that support a fair transition? On, on new electric vehicles, uh, the establishment of local OEMs in order to um, transform the, 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 the last mile delivery and that's quite a focus of us. So we've developed a company with the name of Mellow Caps, which is currently scaling up as well as exporting uh, into Europe. Fuel cell manufacturing um, technologies developed in South Africa, hard to abate a sector such as steel, and we're specifically focusing on direct reduced iron because we believe that we do have a competitive advantage as South Africa to export this. And then very important is to also look at some of the enablers of, of this transition. Those are the renewable energy projects, um, but also the components that go into these projects. The, the, the battery value chain, um, in terms of developing our capabilities of assembly, as well as our chemical uh, capabilities of processing critical minerals. So there are huge challenges, Pamela, in, in developing these projects. You need to, some of them are really early stage, and there's the huge technology risks. They are very long term, um, and they do not show um, viability at this point in time. So you need to be bold to actually look at how you're going to address this. And then, of course, you, it requires huge amounts of funding. It's not cheap technologies. So what have IDC done in order to, to address these initiatives? Uh, the first one is that we really have an ecosystem approach. We realize if you want to develop these projects, it cannot happen in isolation. You need to put the policy environment in place. You need to have a supportive infrastructure ecosystem available. And uh, therefore, we are currently on the JET IP implementing the project management offices for green hydrogen and NEVs. The second thing we've done, we focused on catalytic projects. So um, we need to have real stuff that we're dealing with in order also to solve the ecosystem problems because only through the, the, the real catalytic projects you can actually go and unbottleneck some of the ecosystem challenges. I think I'll talk in the main to you the product that we have deployed within the, the DPSA. And for us, the starting point is our own um, uh, project preparation uh, uh, facility that we use really to transition projects from uh, feasibility to, to, to bankability. And uh, we, we deploy in the main what we said to us recoverable grants, which are mainly instruments where repayment is contingent on success of, uh, of the project. Um, we are increasingly making sure that the way that we do at project preparation stage really integrate a climate and broader environment issues in how we develop our projects. And secondly, we also deploy a third party funds that are in the main supported by a, our partners in the main MDBs, um, you know, like your AFD. You know, you know, those funds in the main would be grants that we utilize again to uh, support at the development of sustainable projects. Um, and then on the other hand, there is access to your UN convention based mechanisms, your 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 GCF and and the GEF, where we access uh, project preparation 
uh, or project development funds. Mm -hmm. What we tend to do where the GCF is concerned, although you could use those funds to develop specific projects, DBSA took a decision to use those funds in the main to develop what we broadly call facilities. So a facility where you can go once the GCF and come back and support a number of projects without having to go back, which we think is a lot more efficient. And similarly on the GEF side, we access those uh, grants that we can utilize to uh, develop projects. Then there is a question of projects that are sitting way, you know, uh, before um, qualification for um, project preparation, mainly sitting at concept stage. We partner with other entities to make sure that we can support those projects and get them ready for project preparation financing. For example, we recently are working with, uh, have been working with UK Pact, where we work within municipalities to transition projects from concept stage, and then they can then qualify up for our project preparation financing. And then when they get onto, you know, a bankability, then we can then I pass on to our transacting uh, team. And then lastly, I think uh, Nkola make reference to the importance of uh, technical assistance uh, facilities. So in the main, you'd find within the DBSA, for the credit lines that we would receive from MDBs, they'll have a component of a TA that is quite useful, where we are able to build, especially around a policy uh, matters and strategic frameworks that, are, that then become a base upon which we are able to accelerate a uh, deployment. So, you know, as, um, at the high level, that's, you know, the, the kind of resources that we are able to tap into to support project development. We cannot expect from companies to make uneconomical investment decisions. So we, or governments, development organizations, have to create the environment and to provide the support to companies to be able to proactively engage uh, on those activities uh, constructively. And then I think uh, companies will be started to do it. It's critical to have access, whatever the source is, but to have access to, to, to finance and to concession of finance. And in fact, Olympus and the question of the gentleman was, was related to that. We need first uh, concessional finance for project preparation. When, when we do win finance, we have to remind that it's really innovative uh, finance for the moment. Most of the projects are not mature and, and we do need uh, grants. So whatever the, the, the types of resources you can get, uh, the most important is to find ways to, 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 um, to get access to uh, grants and to, uh, to concession and panels. Uh, we, we talked about, uh, of course, domestic resource um, mobilization, but uh, you can have access to international uh, climate funds. Uh, Olympus uh, uh, did talk about uh, the, the, the green climate funds. But also, um, and be, be, because uh, it's complicated sometimes to, to, to access uh, to finance, we need to be innovative. And, and, uh, and I wanted also to mention uh, the different types of resharing uh, mechanisms that, that could be able uh, to enlarge the possibility to have access to finance. And when it comes to uh, attracting uh, private sector, uh, it's also important to be able to build scheme uh, that would reduce the perceived risk uh, and to and and like that to to attract the the private sector and and one more thing um, about uh, also and, and it's an important question the cost of capital in in general um, and it's related also to, to to your question between the, the differences uh, between the, the the north and 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 the south maybe the global south uh, in the global south we know that the cost of capital is higher uh, and 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 because also we are trying to finance more risky or at least perceived uh, riskier projects, uh, it's important to work on reducing uh, the cost of capital. And actually, this is what we are doing within uh, within IDFC, trying to build innovative uh, mechanisms such as securitization uh, vehicles, uh, bringing um, bonds from our northern members together with bone from uh, our southern members uh, securitized it uh, putting a bit of a false loss uh, from the european commission or, or uh, the green Cl climate funds and like that having a that that helps uh, our members to get access to cheaper funding
we really can see already that the transition is not only necessary, but that it is happening. And so what we have within our control is whether we can get ahead of it or whether we're going to just be takers of whatever is coming. And so the need to be able to step up and say, can we help to shape, can we actually put forward the ambition that we know potentially could yield significant benefits for our economy and our people, and we sh it's an opportunity we have to take. And so the NBI wants to work with companies that are leading in that space, that are seeing the opportunity in the transition, notwithstanding, of course, the challenges that we know that are going to exist, but saying, how can we actually work together to shape that so that we can get ahead of that we can actually start to ensure that the transition happens and that it is just but also benefit from some of the opportunities and so that's really what the NBI is attempting to do it's doing that through the research work that we're doing the just transition pathways work which came out uh, a few years ago clearly shows that there's massive opportunity to be had but also that that can be um, that can actually be taken up with the right context and so that's what we're looking at doing uh, and that's some of the things we do and across the board you know, how do we ensure it is inclusive? How do we ensure that it's just? And of course, to be able to give that opportunity for an economic shift that can fundamentally benefit us as a country. Yeah. And what is the importance then of bringing the public and private sector players uh, in forums like this, just in terms of accelerating the jet uh, transition? It's very obvious that this is not something that any one player can do on their own. If we take just one data point, the financing, the financing is never going to be able to be funded by public sector alone. Private sector is going to have a massive role to play, uh, is going to actually fund perhaps the largest part of that transition. And so bringing together the different players and the different entities is going to be critical to achieve this transition in a manner that is just and then, like I said, benefits society at large and allows our economy to prosper. So those partnerships are indispensable. I think public-private partnerships have up to now almost felt like something elusive, uh, but it is critical at this point. So whether we work with government to create the right architecture and enabling environment that can crowd in private sector investment and work with people and civil society to ensure that we've met those needs and we understand what those are is going to be critical if we are going to shape this future that we know we actually can shape. And let's discuss really how organizations like the NBI play the role of connecting and facilitating uh, these relationships. What we try to do is to really find the spaces where we can convene the different players, the different stakeholders. Uh, the the multi-stakeholder engagement and conversation is going to be critical. If we don't get all the perspectives around the table, it's going to be very difficult to facilitate such a transition. So that's one role we play, is that we try our best to convene uh, because of the number of leading companies that are NBI members, but of course not just NBI members, but companies that are interested in the transition. That's one element. And then bringing together government. In fact, the pavilion is a demonstration of a partnership, you know, where business can help support through the sponsorship of the pavilion, but the DFFE of course has recognized that that partnership is beneficial and we work together.